But as we heard the other day in finance, we heard the administration arguing that there should not be the revision. Uh, we heard that from the commissioner and we heard that from, uh, from the director of the tax division. So, um, you know, and, and what they highlighted is exactly one of the concerns that I was, I had. And that was, if we have now established a precedent over the last three years, and, and that precedent, precedent was established in several different manners, right? The governor, when he vetoed, he vetoed down to the way they defined that statute. And they did that for a couple years. Then the legislature last year, by signing the, off on, on the amount that we did, which was $77 million, we essentially sanctioned the, um, what the governor had argued that statute said. So we have three years now of a precedent that we that we've set. So after, to the point that that Representative Wilson said, all right, we're not in a position to be funding uh, just every credit that comes in. Now we need to look at uh, what the statute says. When we move to that point, we and we have established that we're going to do it one way. To turn around now and to have it introduced by the co-chair of finance in a different definition, uh, I think that that erodes our credibility. And so that was the argument that that I have for why, if we're going to pay for the credits, we need to pay for what we have defined the statute to be over the last three years. Now there is another bill, of course, that the that the administration has put out there that could eliminate this discussion because this will keep going for whether it's six years or we can extend it out for 10, 15 years. Uh, this will keep going, or we can eliminate. That. I, I'm looking forward to hearing that conversation because I think it's a very intriguing idea. And but, I, but just with that, but worse than that is that a few years ago when we had the discussion with the oil companies and they basically said that we should pay them all, you know, right now because we made promises. We sat, I sat there as a finance member and said, no, that's not, you know, it was great that we had the money that we paid for it, but no, there's a formula and there's a statute and, you know, we're sorry you're going to have to wait, but that's the way it is. So now when they kind of just went alongside when we finally can start paying off enough of them based on that same formula, the 200 million, now we've changed the game again. These are private businesses that are they're making decisions based on our laws and then we're changing you know, how they're even interpreted on top of it all. And I just want to remind you too, again, these are not the three big companies. These are the smaller companies in which they don't have as much revenue as a BP or ConocoPhillips. So, you know, we set the president's plus, we sat right there and said, you know, wait until the formula pays off. We'll keep paying them as, it, as, as we're supposed to. And now all of a sudden, no, that's not quite right either. We can't keep doing that. And basically right now, if we were to stick to the original formula that we've been using, uh, we'd have those credits paid off in five years. With this new idea of how to read the statutes, it'll take well over 10 years to pay those credits off. And I was wanted to get your thoughts on the governor's proposal of the bonding for these credits. And um, if anyone, I, for myself, I uh, have not seen it in finance, so I can't talk about the details of it. But I can say that I looked at something similar several years ago. Now, just my office and the, and the, the, the few people that we have, you know, that is a really complex subject. We couldn't put something together. So I actually, when I initially saw it, I was very intrigued because I, I, I felt that there was a, there should be a mechanism so that we can stop this back and forth. And I think the fact that they have uh, found agreement and alignment with the people who would be receiving these, where they would take a discount that would essentially pay for the interest, I think that's, uh, it sounds very good. Of course, I I, I do want to spend the time in the in the committee and make sure that I've I've un, understand it in detail and that uh, so I'm not going to say fully that I commit to it but the concept as I understand it I think moves in line with where something I was looking at myself and I don't know if anyone uh, representative Wilson but here's where I'm concerned so is the 44 million dollars that we heard yesterday a way to get the companies to say it may take 10 years to get paid off so um, what the plan for the bonding is that they wouldn't get paid the full amount that they would get what, about yes, approximately 10% yes. less um, so that it would be held harmless. So my concern now is that we attach this new way of calculating so that these businesses figure out, well, the only way I'm going to really get any money back is through this bonding proposal. Um, and it's just concerning because I don't think we should be basically blackmailing um, the companies are saying you're going to have to give us a discount. Otherwise, it may be 10, 15 years before you see your money, knowing that a lot of them used it for collateral um, on their banks and that, that will come due. 
that's not the way to do business. Becky. Associated Press, uh, a different topic for uh, Representative Wilson, the uh, working group that's been tasked with looking at the um, sexual and other harassment uh, policy, they're, they have a draft out, and they ha but they haven't quite fin put all the finishing touches on it. Um, I just wondered your thoughts on, on that process, and if you had um, reconsidered taking the ethics training or the, the training on sexual harassment, or if that's something that that you've still uh, felt strongly about not taking it yet? Well, they do have it out to a third party, and I have taken the training because we did make an agreement, and the agreement was that it would go to a third party um, on that, and that was what I was holding to is because we are not professionals here, and I want to make sure this time when we have um, a policy in place that our employees as well as other legislators know that it will work because, you know, it was kind of interesting where nobody broke the rules. Well, nobody broke the rules because our policy actually was so poor to where Basically, all you had to do is make a report. Whoever you made the report to, they then decided, you know, what they were going to do, whether a talk to was enough, a follow-up would be. I'm hoping there's much more stringency in this because, as, as you've already seen, two legislators are now not here. We don't know what else has happened in the past, but we have to make sure that um, not just that it's safe, but if something does happen, that you will know what was going on. I think that's where the ball was dropped the most with the, with the young lady is that she went out, of, you know, she made sure she told her story. Nobody got back to her. As far as she knew, everything was going to, you know, stay the same way. And I can't imagine how uneasy that had to make her feel until eventually, you know, eventually she felt she had to leave. We can't let that happen again. Just to follow up to make sure I understand, when you talked about going out to a third party, are you referring to the proposal that would allow for HR to have an independent investigation involving, if there's an allegation involving a legislator, is that what you mean when you're saying going out to a third party? No, right now the policy is going to go out to a third party. Oh, the, so the NCSL. Can, right, so okay. professionals can look at it. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The, the federal government's doing this as well as a whole lot of states. Um, I'm just concerned that once we have a policy that I don't want to find out with the next incident, whether or not it worked, we need to have a pretty good assurance that what we put in place definitely will keep everybody safe here. All right. James. Um, to switch topics a little bit, um, yesterday we saw House Bill 75 debated in the House Judiciary. It's the first real anything approaching gun control that we've seen in the legislature since um, the Florida Parkland High School shooting. Um, a member of your caucus, David Eastman, has introduced a bill that, as one of its clauses, uh, suggests teachers would be allowed, or, or teachers and school district employees would be allowed to carry firearms on school grounds. Wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, is that an idea you, your caucus is going to support? Is this something that's just his idea? I'm curious about that. So that's not a new bill. Bob Lynn had the same bill a few years ago when we had another shooting um, that happened. I, I found it interesting. I think we actually agree um, with the majority on this because Representative Drummond got up yesterday and talked about having, um, in Anchorage, they have officers who have um, guns in them. And I, I think um, in the Florida incident, if somebody there um, could have gotten to it, I don't think we would have had 17 people. I think where the caveat is is that we want to make sure that they're very well trained you know, so they know what to do in those kind of incidents. As far as the bill, I listened to the bill hearing. That is a scary bill. And the reason I say that is because there's not a lot of definition on who is the one who's going to be able to say whether that, that person should or should not have it. You know, are we going to put our public safety officers at risk? Because if someone is found that way, they basically go into the house and take the firearms out, and you have to then wait really maybe up to a couple months, depending upon the court system, to prove whether or not that should have happened. They're, they're, you know, back to the devils and the details on that bill, but, you know, to know who's going to make those kind of qualms um, really concerns me. I have my concealed carry. I, I carry my, you know, gun when I feel I need to do that, and to be able to have somebody say, because of an incident, that that may not be a good thing, I think is opening up a door to a lot of misuse. I was in Tilton. Uh, thank you. You know, I'm not opposed to anything that is going to um, protect our children. 
Um, you know, starting there, though, also, um, as uh, Representative Wilson said, I wouldn't ever require anybody to carry a gun that wasn't trained or uh, and felt very comfortable in, in carrying that gun. I myself am a concealed carry member um, and uh, took a lot of courses to get that training, and, and so I would never require anybody to do it that didn't feel comfortable doing it. Um, but we've seen a number of states that have a willingness to, to uh, consider the idea of uh, allowing the school staff to do that, but again, with that category, caveat of being uh, properly trained. One thing that I would say and that's consistent with uh, what I have uh, talked about all along is that there is that um, you know local, local option of those local school districts making that decision. And you know and I would add that I think one of the most important things to do in a, in a situation in a time frame that we find ourselves in is to breathe. Um, to take a moment uh, afterwards a, a period of time and and allow ourselves to uh, get past the initial emotion and, and really be cognizant of, uh, with cooler heads, how do we deal with this? I think everyone would argue that that young man in Florida should not have had that gun. I, I don't think that's uh, something that we have a, a disagreement on. Um, but we don't want to uh, do things that could remove due process or could uh, automatically put certain stigmas on people uh, without taking the time to breathe and taking the time to be cognizant of the fact that emotions are high right now. And I, the legislature has taken action in the past when we felt it was necessary to do the right thing in trying to address some of the concerns uh, that we have out there, uh, the, the fixed NICs that we did back in 14. And so, um, so I think that the, you know, this is a, it's a, it's an appropriate conversation. There might even be some, some aspects of uh, what are in 75 that are worth a conversation. My understanding of it, though, is that it goes way beyond that, that, uh, uh, th those, those pieces that I think are, we might even be able to find agreement uh, on, and moves into a place of due process being removed. And that's, I think, the most important thing, is you can't just automatically remove that constitutional right, remove that due process on someone. And, um, uh, and, and, and so that's where the, the bill, maybe, maybe, in the end, as we br start to breathe, uh, we might find a few things that we could probably uh, agree on, because the kids' safety, the children's safety, is the most important thing here. I see Andrew and Rich. What might be what uh, Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network? What might be one or two of those things? So, and I'm only, I'm only going to speak for myself, and I want to make very clear that I'm speaking for myself, as we had not have this this discussion in a caucus setting. And then I'll ask if if others want to speak to it. Um, uh, I think one of the things that that is in there is the initial conversation about a family member. Um, uh, going to the courts. Uh, remember, the fixed NICS bill had it took an established process, um, a judicial process that had been in place for decades, and said based on this judicial process that is there, where they go through the court system. It's it's a very complex. It's very it's it's uh, it's it's something that we have. Uh, uh, built a base of, of comfortability of utilizing and said only with after going through that process can the next stage happen. In that case, it was communicating uh, to the NICS database that an individual had been uh, involuntarily committed for over 30 days and therefore shouldn't uh, have access to a gun. Uh, in this particular case, the one piece of the very first piece that says, hey, the family members that are nearby and they, they can go to a court and, and go through a judicial process. That sounds like something I'm willing to talk about. Now, the devil's in the details, and I'd have to make sure that, that you know, everything there goes through an established process. But that's, I think, worth having a conversation about. Going beyond that, where it's just pretty much an immediate, I'm going to go to the judge right now, I'm going to get the warrant, that eliminates that due process. That's the part that really, really is concerning to me, because it makes a, someone can make an allegation against an individual, and as long as they can convince a judge judge in that short time frame that uh, they can just run out and, and grab us. That doesn't allow for um, uh, a longer conversation. That's my understanding of, of the bill as it currently sits. Um, I don't know if there's others that have any thoughts on, on that, particular, uh, that particular piece, but that's just, again, I'm speaking for myself. Rich Maurer, Channel 2 News for Representative Pruitt. Yeah. Um, so was, uh, my, was the shooter in Florida, was he ever committed? 
I don't believe he was committed. So, so how would you take the gun away from him? And, and that's, it's, it's a good question. That's what, part of why I, um, maybe, that's where maybe the piece that, that I've highlighted they might uh, be something that would work on that. Uh, that the, the people around him, his family, uh, as they had gone and said, hey, here's, here's our concern. Um, I, it's very possible. Sounds like you're advocating for House Bill 75. Do what? Sounds like you're advocating for House no, Bill 75. The whole thing, I, I, there's three pieces to that bill. And there is one that I think, uh, from what I understand in talking to uh, individuals that are uh, focused on gun rights issues, that they say this might be uh, something that is with, worth talking to. You know, everyone, everyone tries to put the box that gun owners or the NRA are somehow the people that are committing these, that, that this young man, that the NRA is the one that did it. And I want to make it clear, remember the NICS database came from the NRA. Right, we can when when the right time comes, we can we can we can sit down, we can breathe, we can have a a good intelligent conversation, and we can figure out things that that might work. And it's very possible that maybe through a piece of this bill, not the whole bill, because there, like I said, there's some due processes that maybe we might be able to come up with something. And if that's the case, it's it's for the it's the right thing is the protection of the kids, protection of the people that are out there. Okay. I think, but I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to really understand the situation. Right. I, I think it's still early on to find out. I, I'm, it's my understanding that there were a lot of things happening with this young man, um, with it. How, how was he able just to walk in the school like that? You can't do that in most of Alaskan schools. Yep. I mean, you pretty much get stopped right at the door. Um, there was a lot of things that went wrong in this incident. And, uh, again, to not have any kind of process. And I think you actually put more people at risk with this bill as it's written right now. Um, I can't imagine a trooper going into someone's home and just literally going through, you know, room by room and looking for guns to take because of, of hearsay. And that's in my understanding that's, what the bill allows at this point. It does allow portion, portion of the bill. And I think um, we're getting to a point where I think we have to go to finance. We have to have um, Because finance. we have a lot of bills up. Thank you for one more, just to follow up. What is what is enough time? You said you talked about it. There has to be a certain amount of time to go from emotion to 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 sort of thinking about this. You know, I think and and without getting into too much detail, it I, I couldn't say. Well, it's been it's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, you have to let emotions uh, settle, and uh, I don't think we're at that point yet, but. You know, here we'll, we'll, you'll, we'll know when it's not the, the, the headline that's at the very front of the uh, every single page. Uh, we're probably past the initial emotion. And when all the facts come out, you can't make a decision without all the facts being in there. Right. And so with that, we'll just appreciate everyone's uh, opportunity, uh, taking the time. We'll remind everyone that we do have public testimony coming up this weekend, uh, or actually today. So if you're in some of these communities that uh, uh, today, even the Matt Sue is the very first stop, along with uh, Seward, Kodiak, Ketchikan. But as we go uh, uh, Saturday, I'll, I'll be in front of people. Please take the opportunity. We, we, we need the public to come out and let us know what they think about the, the uh, various aspects of the budgets. With that... Uh, it's a little after nine. We need to get to finance. Appreciate the time.